Well, here we go again. I've been uh, in favor of getting rid of carried interest for years, um, starting when I was a senator from New York. But that's not the point here. Why didn't you, you know, do it? Why didn't you do it? Because I was a senator with a Republican president. Oh, really? I will be the you president. You could have done it. If you, were an effective, uh, if you were an effective right. senator, you could have done it. If you were an effective senator, you could have done it. But you were not an effective senator. Please allow her to respond. She didn't interrupt you. You know, under our Constitution, presidents have something called veto power. Look, he has now said repeatedly, 30 years this and 30 years that. So let me talk about my 30 years in public service. I'm very glad to do so. Eight million kids every year have health insurance because when I was first lady, I worked with Democrats and Republicans to create the children's health insurance program. Hundreds of thousands of kids now have a chance to be adopted because I worked to change our adoption and foster care system. After 9-11, I went to work with Republican mayor, governor, and president to rebuild New York and to get health care for our first responders who were suffering because they had run toward danger and gotten sickened by it. Hundreds of thousands of National Guard and Reserve members have health care because of work that I did. And children have safer medicines because I was able to pass a law that required the dosing to be more carefully done. When I was Secretary of State, I went around the world advocating for our country, but also advocating for women's rights to make sure that women had a decent chance to have a better life and negotiated a treaty with Russia to lower nuclear weapons. 400 pieces of legislation have my name on it as a sponsor or co-sponsor when I was a senator for eight years. I worked very hard and was very proud to be re-elected in New York by an even bigger margin than I had been elected the first time. And as president, I will take that work, that bipartisan work, that finding common ground, because you have to be able to get along with people to get things done in Washington. Thank you, Secretary. And I've proven that I can. And for 30 years, I've produced results for Thank people. Thank you, Secretary. We're going to move on to Syria. Both of you have mentioned that. You said a lot of things. We, you, you, I mean, I think we should we can, be allowed no, to Mr. maybe... Mr. Trump, we're going to go on. This is she about the audience. Mr. Senator, Trump, we're disaster. going to move on. The heartbreaking video of a five-year-old Syrian boy named Amran sitting in an ambulance after being pulled from the rubble, rubble after an airstrike in Aleppo focused the world's attention on the horrors of the war in Syria, with 136 million views on Facebook alone. But there are much worse images coming out of Aleppo every day now, where in the past few weeks alone, 400 people have been killed, at least 100 of them children. Just days ago, the State Department called for a war crimes investigation of the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad and its ally, Russia, for their bombardment of Aleppo. So this next question comes from social media through Facebook. Diane from Pennsylvania asks, if you were president, what would you do about Syria and the humanitarian crisis in Aleppo? Isn't it a lot like the Holocaust when the U.S. waited too long before we helped? Secretary Clinton, we will begin with your two minutes. Well, the situation in Syria is catastrophic. And every day that goes by, we see the results of the regime uh, by Assad in partnership with the Iranians on the ground, the Russians in the air, bombarding places, in particular Aleppo, where there are hundreds of thousands of people, probably about 250,000 still left. And there is a determined effort by the Russian Air Force to destroy Aleppo in order to eliminate the last of the Syrian rebels who were really holding out against the Assad regime. Russia hasn't paid any attention to ISIS. They're interested in keeping Assad in power. So I, when I was Secretary of State, advocated, and I advocate today, a no-fly zone and safe zones. We need some leverage with the Russians uh, because they're not going to uh, come to the negotiating table for a diplomatic uh, resolution unless there is some leverage over them and we have to work more closely with our partners and allies on the ground but I want to emphasize that what is at stake here is the ambitions and the aggressiveness of Russia 
Russia has decided that it's all in in Syria. And they've also decided who they want to see become president of the United States, too, and it's not me. I've stood up to Russia. I've taken on Putin and others. And I would do that as president. I think wherever we can cooperate with Russia, that's fine. And I did as Secretary of State. That's how we got a treaty reducing nuclear weapons. It's how we got the sanctions on Iran that put a lid on the Iranian nuclear program without firing a single shot. So I would go to the negotiating table with more leverage than we have now. But I do support the effort to investigate for crimes, war crimes, committed by the Assyrians and the Russians and try to hold them accountable. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. First of all, Mr. she Trump. was there as Secretary of State with the so-called line in the sand, which... No, I wasn't. I was gone. I hate to interrupt okay. you, but... But you were in contact, point, excuse me. At some you point, were, we need You to were in total fact, contact with the White House. And perhaps, sadly, Obama probably still listened to you. I don't think he'd be listening very much anymore. Obama draws the line in the sand. It was laughed at all over the world what happened. Now, with that being said, she talks tough against Russia. But our nuclear program has fallen way behind, and they've gone wild with their nuclear program. Not good. My government shouldn't have allowed that to happen. Russia is new in terms of nuclear. We are old, we're tired, we're exhausted in terms of nuclear. A very bad thing. Now, she talks tough. She talks really tough against, against uh, uh, Putin and against Assad. She talks in favor of the rebels. She doesn't even know who the rebels are. You know, every time we take rebels, whether it's in Iraq or anywhere else, we're, we're arming people. And you know what happens? They end up being worse than the people. Look at what she did in Libya with Gaddafi. Gaddafi's out, it's a mess. And by the way, ISIS has a good chunk of their oil. I'm sure you probably have heard that. It was a disaster. Because the fact is, almost everything she's done in foreign policy has been a mistake and it's been a disaster. But if you look at Russia, just take a look at Russia and look at what they did this week, where I agree she wasn't there, but possibly she's consulted. We sign a peace treaty. Everyone's all excited. Well, what Russia did and with Assad, and by the way, with Iran, who you made very powerful with the dumbest deal perhaps I've ever seen in the history of deal-making, the Iran deal with $150 billion, with the $1.7 in cash, which is enough cash to fill up this room. But look at, look at that deal. Iran now and Russia are now against us. So she wants to fight. She wants to fight for rebels. There's only one problem. You don't even know who the rebels are. Mr. Trump, so Mr. What's Trump, the purpose? you're two and, minutes And what do you have to say? You're two minutes I don't like up. Assad at all, but Assad is killing ISIS. Russia is killing ISIS, and Iran is killing ISIS. And those three have now lined up because of our weak foreign policy. Mr. Trump, let me repeat the question. If you were president, what would you do about Syria and the humanitarian crisis in Aleppo? And I want to remind you what your running mate said. He said, provocations by Russia need to be met with American strength and that if Russia continues to be involved in airstrikes along with the Syrian government forces of Assad, the United States of America should be prepared to use military force to strike the military targets of the Assad regime. Okay. He and I haven't spoken and I disagree. I disagree. You disagree I think with your we running have to mate. knock out ISIS. Right now, Syria is fighting ISIS. We have people that want to fight both at the same time. But Syria is no longer Syria. Syria is Russia, and it's Iran, who she made strong, and Kerry and Obama, made into a very powerful nation and a very rich nation very, very quickly, very, very quickly. I believe we have to get ISIS. We have to worry about ISIS before we can get too much more involved. She had a chance to do something with Syria. They had a chance, and that was the line. What do you think and will happen if Aleppo falls? I think Aleppo is a disaster, humanitarian-wise. What do you think will happen if it falls? Uh, I think that it basically has fallen, okay? It basically has fallen. Let me tell you something. You take a look at Mosul. The biggest problem I have with the stupidity of our foreign policy. We have Mosul. They think a lot of the ISIS leaders are in Mosul. So we have announcements coming out of Washington and coming out of Iraq. We will be attacking Mosul in three weeks or four weeks. Well, all of these bad leaders from ISIS are leaving Mosul. Why can't they do it quietly? Why can't they do the attack, make it a sneak attack, and after the attack is made, 
Inform the American public that we've knocked out the leaders, we've had a tremendous success. People leave. Why do they have to say we're going to be attacking Mosul within the next four to six weeks, which is what they're saying. How stupid is our country? There are sometimes reasons the military does that. Uh, Psychological warfare. I can't warfare. think of any. I can't think of any. It and might be to help get civilians General out. Flynn, and we have, look, I have 200 generals and admirals who endorse me. I have 21 Congressional Medal of Honor recipients who endorse me. We talk about it all the time. They understand. Why can't they do something secretively where they go in and they knock out the leadership? How, why would these people stay there? I've been reading now, for weeks. Mosul, been reading now for weeks about Mosul, that it's the harbor of where, you know, between Raqqa and Mosul, this is where they think the ISIS leaders are. Why would they be saying, they're not staying there anymore, they're gone. Because everybody's talking about how Iraq, which is us with our leadership, goes in to fight Mosul. Now, with these 200 admirals and generals, they can't believe it. All I say is this, General George Patton, General Douglas MacArthur are spinning in their grave at the stupidity of what we're doing in the Middle East. I'm going to go to Secretary Clinton. Secretary Clinton, you want Assad to go. You advocated arming rebels, but it looks like that may be too late for Aleppo. You talk about diplomatic efforts. Those have failed. Ceasefires have failed. Would you introduce the threat of U.S. military force beyond a no-fly zone against the Assad regime to back up diplomacy? I would not uh, use American ground forces in Syria. I think that would be a very serious mistake. I don't think American troops should be uh, holding territory, which is what they would have to do as an occupying force. I don't think that is a smart strategy. I do think the use of special forces, which we're using, uh, the use of uh, enablers and trainers in Iraq, which has had some positive effects, uh, are very much in our interests, and so I do support what is happening. But let so me. So, what just, would you do differently than President Obama is well, doing? Mar Martha, I hope that by the time I, if I'm everything, I hope by the time I am president, that we will have pushed ISIS out of Iraq. I do think that there is a good chance that we can take Mosul. Uh, and you know, Donald says he knows more about ISIS than the generals. No, he doesn't. Uh, there are a lot of uh, very important planning going on, and some of it is to signal uh, to the Sunnis in the area, as well as Kurdish Peshmerga fighters, that we all need to be in this, and that takes a lot of planning and preparation. I would go after Baghdadi. I would specifically target Baghdadi, because I think our targeting of al-Qaeda leaders, and I was involved in a lot of those operations, highly classified ones, made a difference, so I think that could help. I would also consider arming the Kurds. The Kurds have been our best partners in uh, Syria, as well as Iraq, and I know there's a lot of concern about that in some circles, but I think they should have the equipment they need so that Kurdish and Arab fighters on the ground are the principal way that we take Raqqa after pushing ISIS out of Iraq. Thank you very much. We're going to you move know, on. Funny, she we went got... over a minute over, and you don't stop her. When I go one second over, it's you like... You had many it's answers. Really, it's really very interesting. We've got a question over here from uh, James Carter. Mr. Carter? My question is, do you believe you can be a devoted president to all the people in the United States. That question begins for Mr. Trump. Absolutely. I mean, uh, she calls our people deplorable, a large group, and irredeemable. I will be a president for all of our people, and I'll be a president that will turn our inner cities around and will give strength to people and will give economics to people and will bring jobs back because NAFTA signed by her husband is perhaps the greatest disaster trade deal in the history of the world, not in this country. It stripped us of manufacturing jobs. We lost our jobs, we lost our money, we lost our plants. It is a disaster. And now she wants to sign TPP even though she says now she's for it. She called it the gold standard. And by the way, at the last debate she lied because it turned out that she did say the gold standard 
Then she said she didn't say it. They actually said that she lied, okay? And she lied, but she's lied about a lot of things. I would be a president for all of the people, African Americans, the inner cities, devastating what's happening to our inner cities. She's been talking about it for years. As usual, she talks about it, nothing happens. She doesn't get it done. Same with the Latino Americans, the Hispanic Americans, the same exact thing. They talk, they don't get it done. You go into the inner cities and you see it's 45% poverty. African Americans now 45% poverty in the inner cities. The education is a disaster. Jobs are essentially non-existent. I mean, it's, you know, I, and I've been saying at big speeches where I have 20 and 30,000 people, what do you have to lose? It can't get any worse. And she's been talking about the inner cities for 25 years. Nothing's going to ever happen. Let me tell you, if she's president of the United States, nothing's going to happen. It's just going to be talk. And all of her friends, the taxes we were talking about, and I would just get it by osmosis. She's not doing any me favors. But by doing all the others' favors, she's doing me favors. Mr. Trump, thank but, you. But I will tell you, she's all talk. It doesn't get done. All you have to do is take a look at her Senate run. Take a look at upstate New York. Your two minutes is up. Secretary Clinton, it turned out two to minutes. Be a disaster. You have two minutes, Secretary Clinton. Well, 67% of the people voted to reelect me when I ran for my second term. And I was very proud and very humbled by that. Mr. Carter, I have tried my entire life to do what I can to support children and families. You know, right out of law school, I went to work for the Children's Defense Fund. And Donald talks a lot about, you know, the 30 years I've been in public service. I'm proud of that. You know, I started off as a young lawyer working against discrimination against African-American children in schools and in the criminal justice system. I worked to make sure that kids with disabilities could get a public education, something that I care very much about. I have worked with Latinos. One of my first jobs in politics was down in South Texas registering Latino citizens to be able to vote. So I have a deep devotion to use your absolutely correct word, to making sure that every American feels like he or she has a place in our country. And I think when you look at the letters that I get, a lot of people are worried that maybe they wouldn't have a place in Donald Trump's America. They write me, and one woman wrote me about her son, Felix. She adopted him from Ethiopia when he was a toddler. He's 10 years old now. This is the only country he's ever known. And he listens to Donald on TV, and he said to his mother one day, will he send me back to Ethiopia if he gets elected? You know, children listen to what is being said, to go back to the very, very first question. And there's a lot of fear that, in fact, teachers and parents are calling it the Trump effect. Bullying is up, a lot of people are feeling, you know, uneasy, a lot of kids are expressing their concerns. So first and foremost, I will do everything I can to reach out to everybody, Secretary Democrats, Clinton. Republicans, independents, people across our country. If you don't vote for me, I still want to be your president. Your I want to be the up. best president I can be for every American. Secretary Clinton, your two minutes is up. I want to follow up on something that Donald Trump actually said to you, uh, a comment you made last month. You said that half of Donald Trump's supporters are, quote, deplorables, racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. You later said you regretted saying half. You didn't express regret for using the term deplor deplorables. To Mr. Carter's question, how can you unite a country if you've written off tens of millions of Americans? Well, within hours, I, I said that I was sorry about the way I, I um, talked about that because my argument is not with his supporters, it's with him and with the hateful and divisive campaign that he has run and the inciting of violence at his rallies and the very uh, brutal kinds of comments about not just women, but all Americans, all kinds of Americans. And what he has said about African Americans and Latinos, about Muslims, about POWs, uh, about immigrants, about people with disabilities, he's never apologized for. And so I do think that a lot of the tone and tenor that he has said, I'm proud of the campaign that Bernie Sanders and I ran. We ran a campaign based on issues, not insults, and he is supporting me 100%. Because we talked about what we wanted to do. We might have had some differences 
and we had a lot of debates, Thank you, but we believed that we could make the country better, and I was proud of that. I'm give you a minute, 20 We have a divided nation. We have a very divided nation. You look at Charlotte, you look at Baltimore, you look at the violence that's taking place in the inner cities, Chicago. You take a look at Washington, D.C. We have a increase in murder within our cities, the biggest in 45 years. We have a divided nation because people like her, and believe me, she has tremendous hate in her heart. And when she said deplorables, she meant it. And when she said irredeemable, they're irredeemable. You didn't mention that. But when she said they're irredeemable, to me, that might have been even worse. She said she's some of them are irredeemable. She's got tremendous hatred. And this country cannot take another four years of Barack Obama. And that's what you're getting with her. Mr. Trump, let me follow up with you. In 2008, you wrote in one of your books that the most important characteristic of a good leader is discipline. You said if a leader doesn't have it, quote, he